Yeah. Hope everybody's paying attention today because we have a returning guest in studio today, and his name is Ron Days, and he has a new book out called Raptors in the Rice Lands, and we're going to talk about that and how it relates to his world. He's a he's an expert in Gullah culture. Uh, he's local to the Charleston, South Carolina area. Uh, Mr. Ron Days, tell me a little bit about how this, this story developed. Well, uh, there were two books that we spoke about the last mm-hmm. time. They're part of my Geechee Literature series, which I started just to show that Gullah Geechee culture is a living culture, that the beliefs, the practices, the spirituality aren't things from some 200 to 800 years ago, but that they are part of our everyday life. Let's readers know and understand the living culture of Gullah Geechee people. Well, Ron has a, has a little bit of spirituality and thing going on where he, he, he feels certain things, and I can relate to that because I feel a lot of the stuff I talk about, and I think he feels stories that he makes relatable to kind of tell a little bit about some of the situations on the, in the Gullah culture. So when you, when you relate this to real life, we talked about rap, raptors and people turn into raptors when they see an opportunity. Uh, what does that look like in your world? What does that look like? Uh, to understand that when people give you something, they almost always are looking for something in return. Now, it may not be uh, anything negative. Maybe it's just if it's a part of their virtue, they want to be recognized sometimes because of it. But at other times, if people assist you in any way, you need to know what it is that they're looking for. Or you'll be blindsided or you'll find that uh, as when dealing with a raptor, you've been plucked, Um, you've been devoured and the raptor has flown away looking for another (laughs) to do the same thing. Now, when you break this down, talking about Gala in this book reference Jamaicans, you know, what is that, you know, the different cultures? When you say Gala, you know, these guys from Charleston, the, the white guys from Charleston, the Jamaicans, Gala, you have different, little different types of culture being made sim- similar and they're not. What does that trigger in you? Well, first let me explain um, that Gullah Geechee people um, are descendants of West Africans, uh, primarily those from the rice coast who produced rice, but also along the other West Coast countries of Africa were brought to this country to work uh, for the production of cash crops. Rice was the cash crop of the Georgetown uh, community, and that is uh, the setting of this novel, Raptors in the Riceless. But um, there were numerous other Africans who were brought to other parts of the world, part of the transatlantic slave trade. And that's a part of the African diaspora. So Gullah Geechee culture is very related to the other cultures of the African diaspora, Jamaica, the West Indies, even Brazil. In our beliefs, our food practices, our spirituality, all those are similar. As far as dealing with raptors, well, it, it, it different aspects of one's culture. Um, if raptors dealing with the, uh, the food ways, if there are others who wish to appropriate that culture, but they have no understanding of it, that's a misappropriation uh, mm-hmm. of that. If there is uh, some spiritual belief and others think that they can do the same thing, they realize that they may just miss the essence of what those who are in, uh, relating in that way, and they don't re- really get to know it. One of the characters in this book is a root doctor. Mm-hmm. Um, he is William Duncan. And as it is in um, throughout history, many people feel that root doctors are those who engage in who do what are part uh, are participating in these pagan religions of West Africa, mm-hmm. and they should be uh, Christian or Christianized without realizing that many of the beliefs uh, that Gullah, the religious beliefs of Gullah Geechee people and African Americans um, in general are, have been creolized. There have been these um, initial West African beliefs that were introduced, some, to 
Christianity, and there are some things that are regarded differently by those who say that they are purely Christian mm -hmm. than those who call themselves Christian, but they adhere to some of these basic beliefs. As with, with Gullah Geechee people, there is the belief that our ancestors um, are among us. They are part of our great cloud of witnesses. They are looking down on us to protect us. Others will say that can't be. Once you're dead, you're dead. Mm -hmm. And there's no part of you that you may be reunited with them if they also are Christians and all together you get to heaven again. Otherwise, you're not. There, um, uh, some characters are going to a graveyard. They're pouring a libation. And I served as a former chairman of the Federal Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor Commission. When we, the commission, had a meeting in the Georgetown community, we met at Brooklyn Gardens, mm -hmm. where I retired last year after 18 years. And this particular commissioner member had family members who were buried in one of the slave graveyards of Brooklyn plantations, which was established on four former rice plantations. But she began our entry into this graveyard by saying a prayer. She said that was necessary because you're going into their home. When we talked about Gullah culture, there's some very unique things that people didn't know. First of all, the narrative that was created mm -hmm. uh, about the Gullah culture and the rice situation. So these white guys over here needed people to raise, you know, their rice, and they weren't smart enough to to do that and grow their rice the right way. So they had to get the Gullah uh, people and and bring them here to do that. So that kind of ties in with 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 the rice. So they were kind of special a specialist for that area, right? Mm -hmm. For this type of rice. So in this book, they talk about bringing in these Jamaicans and they're a little different maybe on how they... In this book, and um, one character, Otis Doyle, he is a, a white investor and he tries to um, connect with others to become investors uh, to bring some Jamaicans to the Myrtle Beach area okay. to serve in the, um, the restaurants, upscale restaurants in a raptor like is that they the investors would be helping those who they bring because they live in the poor of the poorest sections of Jamaica and if they are brought here um, to this country um, to they sound like Gullah Geechee people they would um, could be paid less money than Gullah Geechee people he, he was bringing in Jamaicans here because he thought it was more affordable correct that is yeah. the word. Really didn't care about the humanity of this people. He had no intention that if these people got sick while they are in this country, what would happen? Because perhaps they would not be insured. And they what, what would their living conditions look like? To him, even if they're put in a Motel 6 restaurant, it would be better than where they're from. Gotcha. Those are the kinds of raptor-like ideas that he tried to spread among, um, among the other investors. But in the Georgetown community, as in Charleston, Carolina gold rice was the rice that was grown. And Carolina gold rice was the rice that brought in the most cash. And it is what made the planters wealthier than the European kings um, and queens. Now, this book is laid out. Um, so does that speak to why the Carolina gold rice, I don't know if we talked about this before, but does that speak to why Charleston was so prosperous? Yes, indeed. All the plantation owners grew rice, Carolina gold rice. Gotcha. And this book is laid out in four acts, all to the planting season of rice. There are four acts, and each of the chapters are based on the um the the production of rice the four acts are planting growing harvesting and then threshing and milling uh there are four chapters in each of the acts like breaking the ground coating the rice seeds covering the hole with a with a foot these are the things that the africans brought with them and helped to raise the economy of south carolina and uh the africans were brought here they were ripped from their families 
reptoir-like, mm-hmm. and but uh, our culture has impacted all of American culture, and the different beliefs and practices that are brought out in this book are mm-hmm. some of the things that I want people to be aware of. My enlightenment and my so forth has kind of grown a little bit since the last time I talked to Ron. But if you think about that, I had this rationale about salt to the earth. We talked about salt to the earth people. And, you know, I feel like salt to the earth people were the original people. I think there was four bloodlines, uh, the Egyptians, the Nubians, the Libyans, and the Asiatics. Um, And I think the knowledge they had to do this, to engineer the rice and create this amount of wealth for someone else is very, very interesting. Very, very interesting because that knowledge, you don't, you know, back then, where do you get that knowledge from to do this? Had to come from an ancient place. Right. And that speaks to the Gullah Geechee people being from an ancient place and ancient lineage misrepresented uh, over time. And and there's a funny little rationale, something you said about the character, the root doctor. And this just is just a functionality thing. It's very interesting to me. It's something I learned about food was that some things like kale, uh, broccoli, things we've had in our diet for a long time, leaf bearing vegetables have a thing where, and a lot of people don't know this, is, is they have this thing they discrete. You know these leaf type vegetables discrete this thing where uh, where they don't want to be picked comes out and, and this stuff that they these leaf type vegetables discrete is a defense mechanism of not wanting to be picked and it's not good for human beings mm-hmm. and a lot of people don't know that so when you talk about the root doctor root vegetables are vegetables that don't have that defense mechanism so it's very very interesting that there were people that were root doctors because maybe they understood that was a pure source or yes homeopathic um, reasons they were used uh, for their different herbs, plants, um, seeds, roots were used for their medicinal, for medicinal purposes. Um, As you and I were saying earlier, um, that there is, among Gullah people, there is a belief there is energy in every living thing. And one of the characters, um, William Duncan, mm-hmm. known as the root doctor, and some people have feared him, but he has a son, Gregory Duncan. Gregory Duncan a- engages in the use of plants. And he uh, there's a scene where he realizes, let's see if I can find it on. Um, Gregory concluded his explanation before walking to the time clock at the far end of the kitchen. God is divine energy, he said, and light is energy. If you use a positive energy to circle around and around any negative energy, the negative energy won't thrive. Florence, we are each the wheel in the middle of the wheel. Like the song you were singing, that's the truth I want people to know. And people need to realize that casting negative energy on others will pull negative energy right back onto them. And the, and the third part of that other thing, you're talking about the Christians. Mm-hmm. You know, one thing I've always said that, you know, people weren't anything until they created the word. Because I, I, talk, I see all this stuff in media and so forth about people having issues, anti-Semitic this, anti-Semitic this. But when you think about it, like I said, nobody was anything until they created the word. And, you know, if you think before the word was created, then what was everybody? And if there's one God, there's one quantum field, symbi- being symbiotic, God wanted creation to be symbiotic, you know, it's naive to me, that some Christians might think their religion is better than other people when there's only one God. I've never understood that rationale and using fear to sign up for their thought process. Correct. I identify as a follower of Christ. I am sometimes apprehensive to use Christian because there are different ideas attached to that word. Mm -hmm. That some people who identify as Christian are very diametrically opposed to the belief systems of others who use that word to yeah. ad- to self identify ask yourself that question if you know if there's one god why does everybody think their religion is better than everybody else's <laughs> That's an interesting topic. Uh, so as far as the the one the middleman here in this story, you know, he starts to realize that maybe, you know, he's turning into who's paying him. Is that what you're saying? Florence and Chadwick Wineglass. 
Yeah. The, um, they are the main characters. They are the ones who are had this hope of uh, spreading economic legacy um, among their 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 community members. But you know, as I said, they begin to feel that they are. They begin to realize that they are raptor-like in their intentions, and they change. Just uh, the thought of in dealing with Gullah Geechee culture, I wanted to share that my, my daughter, Sarah Makiba Days, uh, she did research and can't, coined the term the South is a portal. It's a timeless place. I shared some of that in this writing. I said, daily, the moon waxed and waned, rose and fell, and the salt infused low country air for generations. One day has always been as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Time is not linear. Today's happenstance occurred yesterday and will occur tomorrow. Youths, elders, and ancestors, living and deceased, are a continuum. Sung with a sea island lilt and an African diasporic pulsation, their voices resound in the immortal words of a Gullah Geechee song. We've been coming a long time, oh yeah. We've been coming a long time, oh yes. We've been coming a long time, coming a long time, coming a long time, oh yeah. If you didn't know, Ron's a singer too. <laughs> And there are all types of Gullah Geechee uh, references yeah. to the music of Gullah Geechee people, which, like the waterways, is very rhythmic, very fluid. There are old songs that I bring out. There are old cultural beliefs that I bring out in, um, in this novel. You're going to try to turn us into a play? That has been suggested. It sounds like it could be. It. I was influenced in the writing of this book. Well, I was inspired by This Is Us, the TV show, because I found it fascinating. They could begin, uh, they would have an episode with characters here, present. But then, you know, things happened, the next episode from someplace in the future. Mm -hmm. And then there's an episode somewhere in between. So you have to follow along. You know these characters' lives at different points of each of their lives, and it's not linear. So uh -huh. that's the layout of this book. You know, it's very simple. It's very clean. It's very, you know, I could I could visually see it. Sometimes it's hard to see books, mm -hmm. but I think if you can visually see it. And when you talk about the Gullah cult culture and you talk about the power of the mind, I've been thinking about this thing, when it, this being symbiotic. And a lot of people talk about yin and yang. But if you accept light, if you accept dark, you can accept whatever. But if you're in the moment, you're really not accepting anything. Uh, that's why I question the yin and yang thing. Because if you're in the moment, you're not questioning anything. What is the, what is the thought process about the Gullah culture uh, you know, in the power of the mind? Did they do any type of mental practices uh, that might have been a little spiritual that other cultures may not do? Well, there are different, um, as part of our African heritage, there, are, there have been different rituals, different um, initiation um, practices that due to the transatlantic slave trade, those things have been were stopped. Um, they may have been maintained in a smaller scale by a number of people who were, you know, dealing with acts of resilience. Because if their slave, if the slave owners thought that they were practicing these um, uh, African practices and beliefs, they could have been severely punished mm -hmm. uh, or they could have been killed. But some of that has been maintained. And it was through that, those kinds of, or realizing the importance of passing on stories within families, um, that too is so very important so that the younger ones can realize in what ways they are like their ancestors, maybe not like their parents, but maybe like their grandparents. Mm -hmm. In the Harry Louis Gates um, episodes where he traces the ancestry of people, that's why those whose family members are uncovered to them, realizing that, for instance, 
they their 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 acting or their performing was much like a great grandparent who sometimes that's what he or she had done mm -hmm. and that's how things have can be passed on the other thing is they had a little gala in the west african cultures they kind of had a little bit of a, a feng shui kind of an asiatic vibe idea and i'll explain why but i think all these ideas have a very you know if you listen to different ideas around the world and it, and it, and it comes from a pure source i think a lot of these ideas are very very similar but they're conveyed differently so when you think about feng shui and i talk about how i, I have this big kick now that people don't realize that science doesn't use one third of law of attraction for all their calculations. So what they use is environment. They use your non-conscious. So what you're made of, take away emotions, you don't feel anything yet. What do you innately are? You have a direction. So this is where the beginning, when you're born in the beginning and the feng shui starts. So when you're born based on your birth date, like I've set up stuff here in this room, my feng shui is that corner right there is success. So I have a success poster right there. I have my chair sitting here because I can see the door here that is aligned with my birthday and my direction and my non-conscious and we don't have to get into the third part where science does include intuitiveness and philosophy but i think you can systematically and use it in their calculations that's why our minds have been hijacked uh because they don't use that third part of of uh, law of attraction but when you talk about how the west africans and and uh gola people how they buried people i don't know if they had something when people came into the world that was directional based on their birthday but i knew know that they buried people a certain way by the water now, what was that? What was all? That's kind of a feng shui idea type of thing. Well, they were generally buried um, so that their heads would be facing east, where okay. across the waterways, where their ancestors in Africa, where their ancestors had come from, and that is because the importance of knowing. Um, your, your your family connecting with your family remaining connected with your family is um is very important to Galagichi people or the essence of Galagichi people um there uh, are different practices such as uh, when there would be conch shells or there would be person a person's personal effects. If someone smoked a pipe, the mm. pipe would be on the grave. If someone was a baker, there might be a mixing bowl um, uh, or a fragment thereof on the grave. If someone fished, a fishing pole, so that the person's spirit, when freed from the grave, would feel at home among his or her belongings. Was there any rituals or any 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 structure about when Gullah Geechee kids were born? Was there any any thought process of that at all? Well, uh, like a structure, they do anything special or different than we may well, not know about. They were naming um, they were naming practices based on the day of the week that uh, a child was born. Uh, that's why the the name Kofi or Kofi uh, from the Ghanaian, Ghanaian practice of a male child born on a Friday was Kofi or Kofi um, as it was creolized. Um, there were different names um, of different days of the week that were assigned to the birth date of the child. If there was a particular occurrence, a behavior of the child or something with the weather uh, occurred at the time of birth, the child would be given a basket name. Uh, or a nickname based on those things. Well, the, the day of the week speaks to a directional thing. I wonder what that relates to. Uh, now, you use, you know, the other two books we talked about when you, the first episode we did, you know, you reference birds a lot. And in this, you're referencing birds again. Um, what is the connection? I mean, I've read uh, parts of language of the birds, uh, uh, saying the language of birds is for the kings on earth. What is the relation with Gullah and the bird usage that you use? Like when I began, a uh, turtle dove done drooped his wings. Mm -hmm. um, and that's available on Etsy at my um, shop, Geechee Literature. As I began writing that book, the bird came to me. Mm -hmm. And um, just as uh, uh, my involvement with the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor Commission, these birds in that story are um, a part of the Great Council of Birds. And they have a specific Plan. And for raptors of the Ricelands, uh, with the thought of characters or persons 
who sometimes assist and you don't know and you begin to think that their assistance is for some uh, negative thought. It was like uh, raptors. All I can say is that when those are, for those two books, those are the images that I was inspired. Well, it's interesting because I've had this connection with these birds. I have a family of hawks. I got woodpeckers. I had this, the robin story I told you about. Uh, but I hear, I, it's weird, like wherever I'm at, mm-hmm. I can hear the birds talking everywhere, wherever I'm at. I noticed that first, right? I'd like to learn more about that and see what that is, you, you know, because there's obviously some type of communication there. Maybe it's something you don't even realize. You, you know what I'm saying? But I think there is something to that. You know, have you ever have you ever thought about that at all? Like, obviously, you know, I'm a deep thinker, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it's uh, very interesting. Uh, so the book it's it's not released yet it's coming out in april april 30th is the release date by bell isle books okay and, and bell isle books is an imprint of brandy lane publishers uh which is located in richmond virginia as a hardback um a paperback and ebook as well as um an audio and i will be doing the narrating of the audiobook audiobooks i've understood i understand must be released after the release of the hardback um copy but at bell www.bellisleaubooks.com as well as amazon.com and barnesandnoble.com raptors of the rice lands are is available um for pre-orders i know this this stuff comes from the heart and, and and what is your hope for these stories well as i said it's my hope that um people realize the significance of Gullah Geechee culture and that it is a living culture i had uh, several people uh to write blurbs and on the front cover there's a blurb from eden royce and eden royce is an award-winning author of root magic she says days has written a genre defined narrative of good intentions gone wrong, rich with Gullah culture and language that highlights our connections through the Caribbean and African diasporas. Uh, Julie Dash, producer and writer-director, she has an amazing um, film that's part of the I am International African American Museum. Um, and she wrote with the skill of a West African trunk minder, Rondes floods imaginations with a story about the importance of history, Gullah Geechee heritage and legacy. The characters reveal truths unknown or forgotten. And also on the back cover, Samuel T. Livingston, um, who is an associate professor, Africana studies and history department of Morehouse College wrote, set against the seasonal and tidal rhythms of rice growing by our enslaved African ancestors, Raptors integrates the reader into the low country in ways few texts have done so have done so. Entering the company of works by Gloria Naylor and Tina McElroy Ansa, this is a story that will educate, incite, and force the reader to turn each page as its characters evolve and revolve in positions of protagonist, antagonist, reapers, raptors, and reavers. Please read this book. A great, great, I guess, plug, uh, if you will. When you talk about Gullah people today, and I've talked to a few locally, they tell me things have changed a little bit. How do you, what does Gullah look like in the next five to 10 years? You're keeping the memory alive. What does that look like and how have things changed? There is an acceptance of uh, Gullah culture. There is an acceptance of it being rooted in West African culture. Uh, During my childhood, no one even wanted to be identified by the word. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, In my community, in my family, we referred to ourselves as Sea Islanders. Now, it's not that we did not, we denied our Gullah heritage. We were proud of our Sea Island heritage. But at that time, Geechee and Gullah were considered ways of speech that were not formal English. And if you did not speak um, as eloquently as possible, that was labeled that you were ignorant or stupid, um, um, that you were unintelligible, which were uh, some of the 
let's see, the thoughts passed on uh, by historians and others as a way, because it said people spoke that way because of thick lips or big tongues or low intelligence as a way of throwing shade at our West African heritage. But because uh, with the work of the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor Commission, there is renewed pride. There are young people who are proud of our speech and proud of our beliefs and proud of our practices. And uh, there are ways, growing into ways of sharing our heritage with the world. I think that speaks to, you know, I think the way we solve a lot of these, if there is anything out there that could be an issue or not an issue, whatever it is, but I think there's a way to finding thyself. Mm -hmm. If people find them thyself, if there's a young guy out there that maybe wasn't, or, or if there's a young guy out there that didn't know he was Gullah, and he's totally giving himself away. He doesn't know thyself. If he taps into thyself, he may tap into something. He may tap into special abilities. He may become a great artist like Ron Days, any of those types of things. But I think that's the evolution is finding thyself. And if, you know, if everybody could find thyself, that's how things get fixed. It's not about finding the problem. You, you know what I mean? Not, there, um, one of the issues um, in the book is just the intro, introduction to the thought of one's inner ancestral child. And um, the, there are, there's a character who's dealing with some emotional um, problems, but he is, well, it is known that perhaps um, these issues are brought on because of the inner ancestral child who's been damaged. The setting, of raptors in the Ricelands is a fictional Gullah Geechee community of Georgetown County, South Carolina. Uh, it is in a setting known as Darkacia um, and Morissina. Um, Morissina is based on the fictional first planter who moved to the area. He was named Morissina, but Throughout the years, it was called Morsna and Gullah Geechee people, who was Mossa, Mossaville is what they called it. And Mossaville, just as in the Georgetown community, there were like 24 rice plantations um, just in that one community of Georgetown County. And um, because of all of the, the pain um, that uh, these enslaved Africans and their descendants, the Gullah Geechee people, had to endure their children, or uh, could be to this very day, dealing with uh, plagues, uh, not plagues, things that have harmed the inner ancestral child, yeah. something. And there are different ex reasons that are portrayed in in this novel but just to think sometimes it uh what when you deal with some type of horror it takes seven generations to remove that out of your family line mm -hmm. so those are some of the issues that um our people have should consider and uh try to seek assistance with well that that speaks to when i what I mentioned before, and we won't get too deep in this meditation thing I did and, and understanding low level energy and understanding that uh, when you have trauma in your life, when you have trauma that, that during that time of that trauma it creates these cracks and these cracks are certain dark low level energy that can get in those cracks and stay with you for a long period of time. And if you don't address that and get rid of that and understand how to get rid of that, that's going to carry over to the next generation and the yes. next generation and that's that's what i'm going through with my enlightenment you know trying to figure out how much how much stuff do i got to get out of here you know that's a big deal i appreciate you coming back on the show in studio it's a great book i mean maybe we should make a movie out of it <laughs> you know uh i can see the, the the picture now is there anything else we didn't go over that well i'd like people to know that the cover image is a painting by my wife natalie days here, I'll, oh, yeah. let me hold it up. Oh, yeah, in the rice fields. Say that again. You better you better shout out mom or she's going to be in trouble. Natalie Days is uh, created the cover image. Um, her work is Oya in the rice fields. And uh, the person who uh, she uh, used for this image is a Georgetonian <laughs> um, who is very proud of her heritage. 
Zenobia Harper. Uh, I think the the art draws readers in, and I think that those who open the book will be filled. Well, Ron, like I said, great having you here. Ron's a great artist. He's a multi-talented artist. He sings, he writes, he tells stories. Uh, he was on a TV show, right? That's right, Gullah Gullah Island. Gullah Gullah Island. Uh, very creative guy. Like I said, it's very interesting to have him on and talk about grassroots of the, the Gullah culture and what that's about. Uh, so Raptors in the Rice Lands, I think that's going to be a great book. This has been the Powerful Ron Days, and I am John Edmonds Cosma, the CEO of Bang Productions. Thank you.